Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Property Management Mastermind Podcast. I am your host, Brad Larson. And today's guest, I'm bringing on Miss Stacy Sawyer coming at us from Washington State. Mm -hmm. And she's given us the North South. So I didn't screw up the intro. Good for me. This is a good way to end the, the last 2020 podcast of the year for the Mastermind. And so what we're going to be talking about today is something I try to do on an annual basis. And it's a goal setting discussion. So we're going to have some reviews of the uh, year of 2020, the entire dumpster fire of 2020. And we're going to talk about going forward into 2021. Because a lot of you may or may not set annual goals that you want to look back at and review. But I've always done this for a number of years. I think it's a great process. And it's almost a kick. I mean, it really is a kick because I do this in writing. And then I go back and look at goals from 12 and 13 and 14. And I kind of giggle. It's like, you know, you see all the stuff you wanted to do, but you may or may not ever, ever accomplished it. And so it's good to do an annual goal setting session. And so Stacy and I are going to be talking about uh, what we have outlined for ourselves and our companies with goal setting going forward into 2021 and some reviews of 2020. And so there's going to be some, some personal stuff in here. There's going to be some family stuff, some, some health stuff. And of course we'll get into some business stuff and talk through some of those things. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Stacy and let her introduce herself. Give us the four W's. So Stacy, if you could give us a few minutes of your time and thanks for joining us today. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. I, I love goal setting. It's one of my most favorite things to do because uh, I love to check things off the checklist. So um, I don't know if you want me to tell you where I'm from. Um, Pacific Northwest, Washington State. I, in the, uh, I'm actually closer to Canada uh, than Seattle. So that's kind of where I am as far as like that area. And I'm the owner broker of Leading Edge Property Management and Weikert Realtors Edge Home Sales. So that's me. And that's lots that. to discuss there. I mean, the yeah. Weikert thing kind of is intriguing. That's a franchise of sales, correct? It is correct. Yes. Okay. So, so you have a management company and then a franchise company for selling. Yes. So um, a couple reasons why I did that. I opened my brokerage in 2016. Um, property management is definitely my go-to as far as like processes, procedures. I can set everything up. It's kind of been my baby. So um, I got that all set up and running and I had my sales division, but it was kind of actually my like um, redheaded stepchild, if you will. I didn't really put a lot of time and effort into it. And that was, that was actually one of my goals a couple of years ago was to kind of get that off and running and uh, kind of have this well-oiled machine, if you will. So um, I knew how much time and work it took me to get leading edge up and with, you know, marketing and, you know, everything that goes into it. You, as you know, Brad, how much time it takes to get everything go going. Um, so I kind of said, well, gosh, I could probably spend another two or three years of working seven days a week, 24 seven to get the sales division up. Uh, or I could buy into a franchise that's already set. They already have everything. So I kind of spent about a good year exploring different franchises or, you know, do I want to do it myself? And at the end of the day, I chose Weikert. Uh, they're an awesome company. They're uh, still family owned. They're out of New Jersey and uh, their core values really matched my core values, which is really ultimately why I chose them. So that's what well, I this did. This is a fascinating tangent right off the bat. I love it because one of my goals for 2021 is to increase the sales. Uh, we wanted to revamp the sales process within, uh, within RentWork. So uh, historically, we've had a 10 to 20% capture rate of the clients that we manage. We're only capturing maybe roughly 10 to 20% of those folks. So if they say, I'm going to sell, we're only getting 15 or 10% of that right now. And it's absolutely killing me. And a lot of it is because they want to go with their cousin. They want to go with their referring agent. They don't know you sell homes, right? Yep. That's always a shock to them when you tell them that. And so it's one of the, the main goals for 2021. And in fact, it's, it's one of my KPIs is I sent you my goal list. It's a two page nerd fest. Yep. And so the it. goal list and one of them was to, I'll quote you is establish new sales agent process and double our sales commission revenue. That's one of my goals in writing for 2021. And so this fits right into it. So, you know, one thing we were talking about in, in you know, getting ready for this episode is to not leave the how aside. Okay, right. we can talk about all, you know, I wanna, I wanna be a runway model. Okay, how are you gonna do that, Brad? You're ugly as shit. So uh, how's it gonna work? It's not gonna happen. But we can talk about the sales process and say, we can figure out a how. Your how sounds like you got into the franchise system. 
Yeah. And so our how is going to be a couple of different things. One, we're going to send out biannual comparative market analysis, whether they like it or not. So in doing this, what we've been doing is creating a special two page comparative market analysis for sale. That's basically a templated form. And so our team members, I've got two identified inside of the RentWorks uh, team. Uh, they're going to be sending out three to five CMAs per day to wow. all of our owners. And it's, it's, it's a crapshoot. It's a shot in the dark of value. We're going to take the Zillow figure. We're going to take the, the county assessment figure, and we're going to guesstimate with a $20,000 window of what the value of their home is. But meantime, gang, this is the point. It's one giant advertisement to all of the owners that we manage that we sell homes. Okay. That's the big part because there is nothing more frustrating in this world is when you uh, hear from an owner, Hey, I just listed my home with Remax. Right. Oh, Stacy, I didn't realize you guys sell homes. I didn't even know about that. You know, that yep. you just want to jump off a cliff when you hear that, right? Yep. Yep. And that, yep. That's definitely why one of my goals a couple of years ago was to kind of get that sales division up and running. And so one of my goals this year is actually um, on the flip side, focus on our tenants as well. Um, because we have a lot of money on the table and I think probably every property management company does. I mean, we have really a gold mine, right? I mean, all of us use all these awesome systems like tenant Turner or show mojo or whatever, like think of all those leads that come in, think of your current tenants. Um, so one of my goals is actually to create a very solid tenant purchasing program. Um, again, they wouldn't be purchasing the home that they live in, but kind of like you, it kills me when we get that notice to vacate of, oh, I'm moving because I'm I bought a home and I'm like, oh, but we sell homes and we have all these great brokers and they could have helped you. And and then, you know, when we could do it all in-house, it actually makes the move out process more seamless as well. Um, That's a big point of what we're advertising in some of our CMAs is going through those talking points. And one of them is it's a seamless process because we have one company handling that transaction. On the flip side, you know, there's there's a lot of legalities where we can't allow uh, two brokers, two companies to touch the home at the same time. You can't manage, Stacy can't manage a home and then let Remax sell the home. It just doesn't work. It's, I mean, there's all kinds of uh, legal issues with that in the agreements. And of course, you know, we're dealing with a tenant, but you, you mentioned a gold mine. And so this is, again, we're going down a rabbit hole, but this is right. great stuff because I love talking about this. And I know people out there listening are like, you know, we're in the same boat because uh, we want to increase sales. And the gold mine you're talking about is let's start on the left side. The owners, yep. the owners of the homes are your gold mine. One, they're included automatic resident silver platter sellers. And two, they're silver platter buyers. Don't, don't forget that they want to buy more investment homes. Exactly. If you threw an investment home in front of them, that looks good, is good, tastes good. They're going to buy that thing. They're going to figure out a way to buy it because these people have means and the single family home investment platform is extremely hot right now. And it's going to be forever and ever and ever. Uh, you know, a lot of folks are moving out of the congested cities and into single family homes. They're getting out of the apartment. So if you don't think that's true, go, go research this yourself with the whole COVID thing going on. Yep. So let's talk about the, the owner managers, right? And so I'm going to, I'm going to be the devil's advocate. Somebody out there is going to say, well, you know, if you try to uh, sell to your tenants, you're poaching, right? Mm. Well, no, not really, because we're talking about controlling the process. Exactly. Can't we control the process better? If we know when they're going to move, we know what they're buying. We know when, uh, uh, when their home is going to be coming available to re-rent. I mean, I argue that we'd control the process better, but going, going back to it, yep. let's talk about the first gold mine on the left, which is the owners. What yep. do you, what are your take on that? What are you doing? Um, so we, you know, I actually really like your idea. And to be honest, we haven't um, really mined that gold mine. So that's also one of our goals as well. Um, you know, and I think you probably know this, but this year I actually bought another property management business. So it's just been kind of a year of like trying to get all that going um, and transferring all those over. So um, kind of the same thing with you. I actually might steal your idea as far as the sending out the CMA and I think getting more in front of the owners as far as like, Hey, this is what we do. Um, one of my other, uh, tasks within one of my goals of the how to is actually, uh, do some webinars for our clients and anybody that wants to watch on how to do a 1031 exchange. 
Um, cause I actually am helping a client do that right now. And I've actually helped a other, couple other clients, um, this year do a 1031 exchange. And I think that that's something that a lot of people don't know a lot about, but they're, it's very intriguing and they don't, you know, they need to work with somebody who really knows what they're doing. Um, not just some random sales broker. And I think, you know, within our company, you know, we have such great experts because we really know the prop, you know, the rental market. We really know the sales market. Um, so kind of focusing on that as well. But. See, that's something I hadn't done is the 1031 classes. I think that's a good idea. I have to give credit to Mike Connolly out of the Bay area for doing the two year, two, two times a year CMA. Now it's not a lot of work if you really look at it. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you pick your inventory of homes and you divide, you know, times that by two and then divide it by 200, there's 200 business days a year, roughly. And that's yeah. the figure, you know, everyone will talk about. And it only ends up being, you know, six or eight CMAs a day, which is a couple hours of time. Now for a staff member, uh, you could do that and have them, one, they do a Zillow check, they do a, a comparative market analysis, they, they do a, a BCAD check or a county assessment check. And then they send out a two pager. It's not going to be perfect, perfect, but it gets, right. it gets you in front of them. So the right. other thing that uh, I would always encourage anybody to figure out is the pocket listing system. And so you may have heard me talk about this. We've implemented this. I want to improve on it this year. That's part of the sales process goal setting is improve on that pocket listing concept. So that conceptually what happens is uh, you work with a owner that you are managing they decide they have to sell for whatever reason. You say, look, give me a little bit of time. Give me a minute, give me a month. Uh, I'm going to take your home and market that to my owner investors first. And mm -hmm. if I can get somebody like that to buy your rental home, then commissions are reduced. There's no vacancy. The tenant can still remain in the home. You don't have to wait till the tenant vacates. Everybody wins in that scenario. Because one, you don't lose it out of the inventory. And two, you made a sale with you know minimal effort because you're putting A and B together and right. everybody wins in that scenario because your owner investors, as mentioned, they are super hungry. They want those deal flows. And so one of the things we did is we implemented a little Facebook group, you know, but mm -hmm. I think we need to revamp that as far as the, right. the RentWorks Investors Club. Uh, we need to push that further. Are you doing anything like that there? Um, not yet. No. And I think that that kind of goes a little bit with one of my goals is focusing on client experience. Cause I, I think again, it goes back to making sure our clients even know that we sell homes and that we're actually experts in that as well. Um, you know, because it's kind of hard to, for them to even approach you and say, Hey, I need to sell, um, you know, and even do something like that if they don't really know you do it. Right. So, right. um, I think ours is probably dialing it back a little bit this year to kind of more start with that foundation, um, and then probably add things on like that. Well, let's go to the right-hand side of that. And let's talk about the tenants because that's the other gold mine that a lot of us are not necessarily farming very well. Right. Uh, we have to let the tenants know that we sell homes. We can help them buy a home. So maybe you can create a, a buyer's incentive program to yep. where if they're, here's what we've done in the past. If they stay with you for 12 months and they make all their rental payments on time, uh, they can hire one of our agents to work with them and they get credited X dollars back towards their closing costs at closing. And so that will come out of the buyer's commission. However, the buyer gets a, gets a free lead on a silver platter for a ready, willing and able tenant to purchase a home in addition to you controlling the whole process. Now that's a limited scope of creativity on the tenant side. Of course, you want to farm to them. You know, you want to right. ping them, ping them, ping them. Hey, we sell, we buy, we buy, we sell. You know, you got to hit them up, but you also got to give them some incentive yes. uh, to potentially include a opportunity to early terminate the lease agreement penalty free. Then they would be like, okay, well, cool. Uh, now I'm, I'm more apt to use your company, Stacy, because I know I can get out of this lease agreement at month nine or month 29 and you're not going to penalize me because uh, I'm using you and one of your agents to purchase a home. And so you as, again, the, the, the listing agent, broker, you can control that early termination to where you can make the owner of that home whole. Okay, you're right. not screwing them over. But also you can take some of that giant commission you're getting and use that to cover the tenant's fees. Right. And here's what I also tell my agents go sell one of these new homes and one of these new subdivisions and look at them giving you this giant commission and a bonus, right? right. And if yep. they're not giving a bonus, ask for one. 
<laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So do you, do you actually do that? Cause we've kind of gone back and forth. We've uh, we were offering that at one time. We actually took that off the table. Now we just offer like a, you know, a buyer credit, you know, at closing. Um, so how successful do you feel that that's working for you? I think it can be very successful. We've done it in the past. It really, the, the absolute where it has to happen is you got to have an agent. And I, I use this term yeah. now with the team, the uh, end quote, you know, the quotations agent, little a end quote, right? You got to have the agent to be able to do this stuff. And that could be a, you know, a person who's very hungry, who's very motivated, who's willing to make a phone call, who's willing to send out an email, who's willing to take a phone call uh, to a tenant who's looking at and interested in buying eventually. It could be six months, a year from now, five years from now. Right. You got to put them in the database and work them. It really t comes down to that. Somebody's got to work those agents. It's not a procedural thing, right? You could put that procedure in, but again, somebody has to touch it because uh, unlike other par parts of your business that can be automated, like an application, okay? Right. Working with a buyer and finding them a home to purchase has to have that, that eyeball, that brain yep. power behind it to touch them. And so that's, yep. where, that's where it's been challenging for us. Yep. And I would say the same for us as well. So that kind of goes back with um, one of my goals for Wiker for my edge home sales is recruiting. Um, you know, we have a pretty good team. We actually, we have a really good team right now, but that's really that um, I am looking for one of those type agents that's super hungry, entrepreneurial, um, you know, will use all the systems that we have. We have some awesome, you know, we have KB core um, on the Wikert side and just really mine that little gold mine, um, because I know that that business is there. So. Well, it's absolutely for sure there. And so again, apologies gang for listening out there. We, we went down this rabbit hole pretty quick, <laughs> but let's get back to it yeah. and talk about the goal setting. So one of the things we want to touch on is why this is so important. Now I believe in the written goals, even if they're, they're crazy. And I also believe doing it, doing them at a year at a time. Now you can do a three year, five year goal as part of your strategic planning, you know, we've implemented the EOS system, the entrepreneurial mm -hmm. uh, operating system. We did that last year, uh, started late in 19, got it fully implemented in 2020. Uh, we use Phil Mazur to implement that. So I'd recommend mm -hmm. anybody doing a, a, a certified implementer of the EOS program. Once that is in place, you'll find out that you do this goal setting session every year, December, January timeframe. You go through all the cool stuff to find your, your vision and your, your organizer stuff. I mean, I, I have a hard time describing it, but I can tell you it works because you get those goals on paper and it's a roadmap of what you want to follow that year. You know, a lot of the goals that I put in here, we're not going to touch them till Q4, right? right? But they're on the goal list. And I know they're, they're way out there in the future, you know, nine, 10 months away. So what do you feel is one of the most important things that come out of the goal setting sessions? Mm, well, I think being very specific, um, dialing it down to, you know, anyone can write out a goal, but if you don't have a, you know, a plan or a map to get there, then it's, what is it just a wish or something? I think I posted something like that on my Facebook the other day, some sort of quote, it's not my quote. Um, but really, uh, I've always used the smart goal system. I've used it since I think my early twenties, the, you know, S M A R T and, you know, just specific, you know, how are you going to measure it? Um, cause a lot of times when I meet with my brokers, um, you know, they'll have this goal and I'm like, okay, well, how are you going to measure that? You know, if you say you want to provide excellent customer service, okay, well, that's a great goal, but what does that mean? Cause that's super arbitrary to, you know, it's just open-ended. Um, so how are you going to measure it? You know, when are you going to measure it? And then what are the daily activities, the weekly activities, the monthly activities to actually meet it? Um, because anybody, like I said, can make a goal, but if you don't have those activities, to get there, then you're never going to reach it. So that's kind of what, what we do. And it's kind of, it turns into a funnel because I've done a goal setting session way, way, way back when with Keller Williams and they do this on an annual basis. They, they start from the end and the end could be, I want to sell a hundred homes this year. Right. Okay. How, how are you going to sell a hundred homes guy or gal first? Yep. It starts with, you know, 10,000 leads whittling yep. down to 1000 opportunities, whittling down to uh, 500 meetings whittling down to 250 contracts, going down to 100 closings. You know, right. it's, it's that systematic in their math. And so, it, you know, it starts to make people realize, crap, I can't do 250 meetings. You know, there's only 200 work days in a year. How's this going to happen? Okay, well, let me get realistic about this. 
And so it does put some realism, as you mentioned, into that goal setting by potentially going, because in our industry specifically, you get a lot of folks that say, I want to add a hundred homes this year, right? right. That yep, arbitrary, that all like the <laughs> all the time we hear it. I want to add a hundred homes. Okay, well, how do you do that? Uh, which means you have to add 120 homes to gain 100 homes because everyone's going to lose around 20% every year. Uh, that's just kind of the industry normal. It might be 25%, it might be 10%, but right. you know, give or take 20%, you're going to have to add 120 homes, which is 10 per month. Okay. How are you getting 10 homes per month? You need 15 appointments per month to get 10 signups. How are you getting 15 appointments? That's one every other day. Okay. Which means right. you have to work 50 leads to get 15 appointments. You right. know, it goes into that math very specifically in what we are talking about in the management side. Okay. So that's a, that's a fun little breakdown of the goal setting and why we do it. Now, what we're going to do part of this episode is go through some of our goals and uh, go through some of the things that we're going to be doing you and I, and this is one making you accountable, making the listeners accountable, making me accountable for the goals that we're putting out there. And it's also kind of giving you an idea of how we do the goal setting and what, what granular detail we get down into versus just, I want to have a good year, you know? Okay. Let's, let's get to it. So, I'm going to talk about some of my stuff and then we'll go through some of yours because you kind of modeled yours uh, pretty close to what I had. And, you know, I'm looking at yours, looking at mine and on paper in front of me. Yep. And so my personal goals, I always start with personal family, health, finances for me personally in 2021. And so kind of giving you the background gang, this is probably more than you really want to know. Uh, I ended up getting a divorce last year in 2019, uh, moved out finalized divorce uh, early this year, moved twice in 2020. So it was a kind of a rough year, but going forward, all that's behind me. And so the family goals, you know, I, I want to plan a spring break trip with the kids. I've got that in writing, plan a great, plan a great summer outing. Uh, my weight goal, you know, I'm part of the PM health group. And so my currently I'm at 220, but I feel I got a little too much in the middle, right? I'll be very frank with everybody out there. So I want to try to eliminate some of that. And so how do I do it by intermittent fasting, following the keto diet, working out. Uh, I even got goals in the golf game. Uh, and of course, financial goals, you know, uh, there's a couple of things I want to do at the home. There's a couple of things I want to purchase like everybody. And of course there's, there's savings, right? Those are my personal family health finances goals. And you had a few in there, right? So this, yep. this gives you an opportunity. I want to, I'm going to hear kind of what you're thinking for this next year. Yeah. Yeah. So I got divorced well, a long time ago, 2011, 2012, somewhere around there. And, uh, kind of was a huge hit financially. It was not a very good divorce to be honest, but, um, so I finally, uh, purchased a home this year, 2020, to be honest, 2020 has not been a bad year for me. So it's been actually a pretty cool year. Um, a really cool 1970s Rambler even had shag carpet in it. So <laughs> I've been doing a lot of remodeling. Uh, you can kind of see it in the background, the shag carpet's gone. Um, but you know, so some of my goals stem around the house, of course, just, uh, like building a fence, getting fence built. I'd still like to remodel the kitchen. So a couple of those things. Um, and then, you know, with my kids being a single mom of three teenagers, um, every year we've traveled at least twice. Um, so this year, unfortunately, we did not reach that goal just with, due to COVID and some other stuff, but, um, you know, purchasing the house, but, uh, spring break, I'd love to be able to take them to Florida, maybe go see Todd Breen and his family again. My boys love fishing, so we'll see. Um, and then personally, I'd like to travel to Belize. Uh, that's a personal goal of mine. Um, and that's kind of stems from a long-term goal that I have to, uh, be able to live remote during our Pacific Northwest winters. So I don't blame you one bit. Uh, I, I spent a one winter there stationed at Fort Lewis in Seattle uh -huh. and, and you can have it. So yeah. <laughs> 60, <laughs> yeah, 60 straight days of rain. No, thanks. Yeah, I know. I'm looking outside. It's kind of gray. So I'm, uh, I love the sunshine and, and all that kind of good stuff. So yeah. And then, you know, also health. Um, I found a great local doctor and kind of discovered some different things about my health as far as like some arthritis and hypoglycemia. So I have to make some pretty drastic diet changes like eating keto and, uh, I'm not really focused on weight. It's just kind of more health and feeling better. Um, so doing some things like that. Yeah, gang. So we're, we're not here, you know, banging a drum for keto at all. But I can tell you, if you live a paleo, low carb, keto type of a lifestyle, it can really work in controlling 
uh, the stuff that you really don't want uh, in your, your, your body. I mean, um, you know, just watch some of those, those introductory stuff you find on YouTube or Netflix or read a book or two and make, make your own decisions. Right. And, yep. you know, you don't have to run a strict keto lifestyle to eat better. Right. And we don't have to talk about that at a length, but um, I don't want people to think that, you know, we're crazy nut jobs because we even mentioned the four letter word of keto. It's not, it's not something to be afraid of gang. It's actually a really good uh, concept in eating well. And, right. Uh, that's what I've adopted. So, you know, you're, you're working at that as well too. Yeah. Well, so mine, I actually found out, um, I found an awesome doctor this year, which is, it was also a, another goal of mine for this year. Um, just cause I've had some kind of major issues um, with some pain and, and whatever. And I actually found out I have a certain type of arthritis and I actually found out I'm reactive hypoglycemic, um, which basically means like my fasting blood sugar is 80. And then when I consume sugar or carbs, it drops. So it'll go down to like 50, which is not good. And that's not normal. So normally it goes the other way. Um, so for me, it's just more of a health thing. And I've always eaten gluten and dairy free for the past you know, what, 11 years. And, you know, I'm in the Pacific Northwest. I'm like half hippie anyway. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so I, you know, it's not really that I really want to go keto. It's just highly recommended for the hypoglycemia. And at the end of the day, I'll feel a lot better because what happens is, you know, by the afternoon, I'll, you know, be just super exhausted and just, I won't feel well. And, you know, you, you can't really you know, nobody wants to do that. So, and if it's easily fixed by what you can eat, why not do that? I mean, you know, I'm not, I don't want to take any medicine. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that's, it replaces a lot of the need for some medicinal stuff that doctors love to put us on. Uh, you know, I'm kind of a conspiracy theorist on that to where, uh, they want to put you on something for life so they can get free golf trips from the drug manufacturers. I know I'm being, I'm being a jerk at this point, but, uh, you know, that's just me being a weirdo. Sometimes I'm thinking those things. So let's get through the business goals. Now, yes. the, the personal stuff is good. And I always want to tell people that's really where the personal family, of course, in the, you know, the family, personal health finances, that's very, very important. That's always the top of my list. And I get down to the business goals. And so I've got a, you know, a bunch of things going on. We got the mastermind conference cooking. We've got, uh, you know, I've got a couple of things with the business here uh, with RentWorks, the management company. Uh, we have, you know, some other things going on around the mastermind to include property manager broker. Uh, and of course, uh, some other things coming up, but you know, so let's talk specifically about our property management goals. So that for me, uh, that's what rent works. Of course, uh, that's the company in San Antonio. Uh, interestingly enough, we turned off everything in Austin. So we were trying to, I'm, I'm going to go back gang. This is a 19 goal, 2019 goal. Uh, at the end of 2019 was to expand and grow into the Austin market, which is an hour and a half from San Antonio. And our concept was we were going to greenfield it, meaning that we're going to grow from scratch, not do any sort of acquisition. And we really just decided to shut that down this year. I mean, last month we said, you know, enough of Austin. Uh, they're defunding the police. They're, they're a crazy society up there anyway. They're, uh, it's, it's just something we don't want to do business there. So we shut it down and we're just focusing on the San Antonio market. And so here's goal number one, reach 1,050 homes. And so historically we've been adding, you know, 25 to 35 homes per month in our business development, but we also lose 20 to 25. It's just the nature of the San Antonio market of reluctant landlords and being military city. So we want to increase our retention by 25%. That's one of my metrics. We also want to reach a certain dollar amount in revenue. Okay. You can do your own monkey math from there. We wanted to reach a certain profit per door metric. And so that's coming straight out of the NARPM accounting standards as the most important stat for me in the NARPM accounting standards is the profit per unit, the PPU. And we were at X, I think for the last year. And we want to get to an increased amount of that. And so that's one of our KPI bullet points, uh, the agent process we talked about. Uh, we want to implement an in-house preferred tenant program. So we're doing something along those lines. We're going to get our CRMC this year, right? Finally, awesome. after applying for it for two years, you know, we've been messing with it for a couple of years. Uh, the CRMC is a great thing to get because forget the designation, forget the cool stuff that, you know, you get a badge and you get to, you know, you get to be in the CRMC club go through the process of it, whether you ever go get it or not, it's a fantastic guide to uh, improving your property management company. 
Now we have so we also have to work into getting a potential new office space. Our lease is coming up in 2022. Uh, we're going to implement some new software. Uh, we're going to do a couple of different things with some of our owners and tenants and some of the business side. So uh, I have 11 bullet points on RentWorks alone, and those are how we goal set. And so where I wanted to go with that, I don't want to necessarily tell you every single goal in detail, but the example you need to take from that is put a dollar figure on it. If you have, I want to have a great year in business and do better. Okay. That's not, that's not a solid KPI. As you know, Stace, your, right. your things are very close to this as well. And I know you're getting to that level is we have a goal in mind for revenue. For example, I know what we did in 2020 or going to do. I feel we can increase that revenue going forward in 2021 with an actual number to that. And so that's where I'm going with it. I want everybody to increase to an actual number. Now, what are your, some of your PM company goals for 2021? Yep. So kind of along the same lines, um, increase revenue. And that's obviously a very uh, broad goal, but I'm not going to go through the numbers. Um, and as I said before, I did buy another property management business this year. Um, so hopefully, well, actually by March, we'll have all of them transferred over. So basically I bought a second brokerage. We're working on signing all the owners into leading edge. Um, I actually hired profit coach. So they just did my whole NARPM accounting standards with QuickBooks and building them. Um, yeah, which is awesome. So, uh, and it's one of those where, you know, I could have said, oh, I don't have all the numbers, so I'm not going to make it a goal. Um, but I, I just don't want to do that. So even though I don't have all the numbers completely dialed in, it's still a specific goal um, because as I work through January with Profit Coach and um, getting everything kind of into building them, then I'll have very specific numbers that then which, we can hit. Which I think is fantastic because implementing the NARPM accounting standards should be one of everyone's goals for yep. 2021. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons that we've dedicated many podcasts to just discussion discussing that. Uh, Profit Coach is the vendor that created those non from accounting standards with Daniel Craig uh, and, and his team. And I think they do a fantastic job. So I would highly recommend, you know, looking at them to help you implement the NARPA accounting standards out there if you're listening. Because Stacy, you see the merit in this and you're getting it done or have gotten it done. And this goes right into being able to know your numbers. So yep. by the end of this year, 2021, the end of next year, excuse me, the end of 2021, you're going to be able to know your numbers from the NARPA accounting standards and say, okay, my number was X in 2021. I want to increase that by 12%, okay? Right. Or put a dollar number above that. That's the beautiful thing of the NARPM accounting standards is it gets you on track to know where your numbers are. And it puts you in a good position to do all kinds of different things, to acquire more companies, to be acquired if you decide to sell, or to just simply put a number on the growth that you want to achieve for the following year. Great stuff, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then kind of with that, um, automating uh, processes, um, I, um, love processes, procedures, everything's written. We currently use Asana. Am I going to, I'm actually switching to monday.com. Um, so with that, I've actually hired, um, well, I'm hiring Tony LeBlanc. I don't know if you know, Tony. Um, so he is going to help us get all that switched over quarter one. Uh, I'm very excited about that. Um, and I think that's going to kind of tie in with, uh, increasing, you know, profit revenue. Um, so it's kind of all. All of my goals, you know, I have four specific goals for property management, but they kind of all tie in together. And that's just kind of, um, that's usually how I'll write them out is as far as like actions and specific. So while they're four different goals, they kind of all work together, but um, I'm very excited about that. I'm hoping that it will actually, um, I'll actually be able to not have to replace a particular um, position that I had in my company once we automate um, all of our processes. So Good yeah. stuff. So I love it. That brought up another good point of one of my campaigns for 2021 is to better control the access to our tenants uh, through a couple different means. One, we want to go through some, some vendor credentialing processes, and that could be using a third party vendor and, or that could be doing a little bit more research on our own to ensure that the vendors that we use in our third party ma maintenance system are uh, making sure they're quality folks that are entering into the homes. I think that's part of what Everybody should be doing, but how well you're doing it, again, the how needs to be revamped. In addition to, uh, I believe that we can offer also augment our services with the with homes that we manage that have in-ground pools. I think there's an opportunity there to ensure that either we can provide a pool service and or we're going to acquire a company that will provide that pool service on behalf of RentWorks for our owners with pools. We've got a pretty good number of them. 
And we can also expand that and offer the services to other property managers here in the region to service their pools. And so it, it's, again, controlling the process because what we do right. now is almost a bit scary. And, I, and I, I hate to even admit it. And a lot of people are doing it this way is they're basically, if a homeowner comes to you with an in-ground pool or an above-ground pool, if, if you're in a certain market, a lot of us are making that homeowner maintain a contract to service the pool on their own. Mm. And we don't know who they're hiring. They could be hiring Joe Bob down the street, who's a convicted pedophile, or they could be using a legitimate company that's, you know, knows what they're doing. But those folks have access to our tenants. And that makes me nervous. You know, again, mm -hmm. we're here to provide a very good service to our owners and our tenants, making sure that everyone is protected and everyone uh, is above board. And I think that's something we need to improve on. So it's not really a KPI necessarily, but it's a campaign because some of the other things that you had mentioned, I want to go back to you is in some of your campaigns was to automate processes and then you had client experiences. Yep. So maybe you touch on that a little bit. Yep. So yeah. So for client experience, so I have client experience and tenant experience. Um, this is actually the first year that I'm actually not specifically focused on growth, if you will, because um, every other year it's been, you know add so many doors and have the specifics around that. Um, but I really wanted to kind of really focus on the experience for our clients and tenants. Um, and that kind of goes back into automating processes um, so that we have more time to have kind of that face-to-face -face and the, the, the better experience. So, you know, some of the experiences um, that, you know, we'll be focusing on is, you know, simple things for us that we just haven't done. For example, on the tenant side is having like a welcome package when they move in. And, um, you know, with that, you know, including information on our tenant purchasing program and then assigning each tenant to, you know, one of our sales brokers or a specific sales broker that may be, you know, dealing with all the tenants, whatever the case may be. So um, just some specifics around that and client experience going back to um, making sure that everything is consistent. I think that's kind of one of, one of my big things for my business. And it probably stems from, you know, kind of back in my retail days, I used to work for a very large retailer and everything was super consistent. And, you know, not only is that important just for customer service, but, you know, fair housing and the every, everything is consistent. So, you know, when you automate and it's just all consistent. So, so here's an idea. So, you know, me being Mr. Know-it-all, right. Just ask me and I'll tell you. Ha -ha. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, one of the things we've done years ago, and this may be something you may want to take uh, or at least look into further is every tenant, when they move into one of our homes, we give them a move in orientation. And so what happens is our other company manager, Riki, who does all of our rekeying and, and they filters and they do the uh, smoke detectors and they do rollover and the inspections of the homes. You know, we do assessments. One of them will physically meet the incoming tenant at their home and they do an assessment with the Z inspector. And so that gives face-to-face -face interaction from a forward facing company uh, representative from RentWorks. And they walk through the home with the tenant that just moved in. And the tenant has them to say, this is, this is, you know, there's a ding in the paint and the, the sink doesn't work and this, and that gets documented fully. It does generate work orders. However, it's a win for everybody because the management company can charge for that service. And the yep. tenant is happy to pay for it because they get somebody that walks them through the home and documents everything with an inspection software like Z inspector. So you're talking about tenant experience. That's how we've been able to improve our NPS score because we also document everything with an NPS score, owner side, tenant side, and that's a whole nother conversation, but getting the NPS score to raise it really was an important thing we started doing was that move-in orientation, getting that tenant settled into the home right away and making sure that if there are any issues with the home, such as uh, the water softener was, uh, the salt was empty when they moved in, or there's a, a, a the microwave right. doesn't work. We identify that right away and we get work orders going right away and get those completed to get the tenant settled in. Once they're settled in, a lot of times it's you know very, very easy to just deal with the maintenance that comes up, they're going to pay rent on time. All that's being automated already, but it does set that tone up front. So if you're not doing that, or if you're listening to me talk about it, I would say, uh, I encourage you to look into it and see how you can offer that service. Yeah, no, I love that idea. And I think this is one of the things I love actually about our property management group is that, you know, we'll type some 
stuff on online. And then, you know, all of a sudden we're on a podcast and talking and getting different ideas from each other. Um, you know, because for me, it is setting the tone in the very beginning. Um, you know, and I, I think we do an okay job. I don't think we do a horrible job, but I always want to be better. And how can I be better than every other property management company in the area? That's really what, what I look at. Um, and it doesn't always cost a lot of money. And sometimes you can, you know, work out those numbers revenue wise. And I don't know how you do it exactly if it's part of your admin fee or what you do for move in, but right. we a charge point. a, we charge a move in orientation fee to every tenant that moves in and they're happy to pay it. You know, they, right. they, we have no objections. We've been doing this for going on three years now. And so it's a great way that same with the, the move in basket. Now that's something we don't do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious how that works. Uh, is it all kinds of cool, good stuff with, you know, bottled water and toilet paper? I mean, what are you doing that? Yep. So our idea is to um, get the re reusable shopping bags. Again, we are in the Pacific Northwest and I understand the uh, shopping bags, uh, the plastic will be outlawed starting January 1st. So <laughs> might as well capitalize on that, right? Uh, the branded leading edge uh, shopping bags and then just putting a couple goodies in there. Nothing, you know, nothing crazy, but yeah, some water, maybe a couple snacks. Um, you know, and mostly just that kind of that feel good, like, oh gosh, you know, I'm walking into a beautiful, like clean home. You know, we do have really high expectations um, that when we onboard our clients, the owners, we say, hey, these are our expectations for this is what we consider a rent ready home. And, uh, you know, so they're moving into a nice, beautiful, clean home and they have a cute little welcome package and it looks better than nothing, I would think. So, and, you know, because we have set our, I did set up our company to be operating a remote and virtual way back before it was like the in thing. Um, so we don't meet our tenants face to face, or at least we haven't in the past um, when they're moving in. So we do everything through DocuSign. Um, there's a key box on the home and they get a cool little welcome emails, you know, as long as everything's funded and has been signed and they get a, the key box code and, um, you know, so it's kind of a nice thing that they'll get when they go in. Well done, because I, I've been a big fan of that for years and years. We've been preaching this for a long time. Uh, there's no reason a tenant has to come to your office at no. all. Mm -hmm. They can apply online. They can pay online. They can sign electronically via DocuSign, and you can move them in via lockbox. Uh, it's the same concept if you've rented a VRBO or an Airbnb. You don't have to go to some distant office location to sign something, to get a key, to drive across town for two nights. I mean, that, that's crazy talk. And so, you know, this is what tenants have become to expect. Now, one differentiator, as you mentioned, so you want to differentiate yourself from your competition yeah. is in the business development side. Uh, some of the companies out there have developed a system to where they never go to the home to see the home in person. They do it all remotely. Now, I, I don't necessarily, I don't condone that, but I don't condemn it either. Um, basically saying that it's kind of neutral. Now, what we do is we still go and offer to go to the home in person. Because again, it's a differentiator where one company in town may not want to get off their chair and go out in the field and see the home in person. Our business development team offers that and is happy to do that. Now, if the owner says, you know what, I'm in, I'm in Bangladesh. I can't, you know, meet you at the home. Great. Let's do everything remotely. I've got a whole PowerPoint presentation we can go through. We can do a Zoom call. I'm here to answer any of your questions. Uh, and then, of course, it goes straight into the owner orientation side. Uh, you know, we talked about the tenant moving orientation. Well, we do have an owner orientation. So as soon as they sign up, uh, we get them on the phone with one of our remote team members who is on salary, right? They can spend 10 minutes or 10 hours talking to that particular new owner about their Fluffy the Cat and how they painted their, their home uh, fuchsia pink uh, 10 years ago. I mean, they can listen to all that and go through all the stuff that we need to get out of them, such as, is there H an HOA? When is the garbage day? You know, how many keys do you have to the property? Uh, how old is the air conditioning? You know, do you have a maintenance contract or a home warranty? I mean, all those questions you'll ask an owner is part of the owner process that you mentioned with the client experience. Right. And so that's something you potentially can put into a remote team member's hands to do that as soon as one of your in-house or even remote team members sign them up for a new business development contract. So all yep. that aside, I know that I've talked a lot about that. Um, what else am I forgetting? What are, what's one of the other goals that we want to touch on to, uh, kind of make this a complete episode? What do you think? Oh gosh. Um, yeah, I don't, well, we've kind of talked quite a bit about everything. I mean, the only other thing that, you know, recruiting on my sales side is 
you know, kind of a big thing for me. Um, but that's not on the property management side, well, but it kind of, it kind of yeah. sort of is. And so I, I want to talk about that a little bit because, you know, that's always been one of my underlying goals, but it's never really come to fruition. I hate recruiting. I'll be very frank with you. Uh, I went to Keller Williams, uh, university, I, as far as their little school that they put on to become a team leader. Uh, I started several brokerages and I hate recruiting realtors. Realtors are the most frustrating animal on the face of the earth. And so I hate recruiting, uh, but I'm a good salesperson. I can talk to people. Right. Right. But I just hate recruiting realtors. Now that's always been a challenge for us because, uh, recruiting, you know, you don't have to have a value add. You have to supervise agents. You have to have splits. You have yep. to have process and procedures for commissions. Yep. Uh, but I would challenge people out there to don't look past that because you do need some agents to potentially service the tenants that go out and rent your homes, whether they are an in-house leasing agent or a co-broker type of a relationship with a agent in your brokerage that they're going to go out and show these tenants. In addition to creating that, you know, we talked about this earlier, there's air quote agent to work the tenant side and yep. potentially even the owner side of your management company. So it's a necessary evil, I would say, right. is recruiting. So tell yep. me about some of your recruiting efforts so far. Yeah. So, so far, you know, I just look at it as, I mean, if you like sales, like I love sales, I love talking to people. It's just sales. And that's, I think if you view it that way, I think maybe you would view it, it would maybe be a little bit easier for you. Um, you know, you could treat it just like you would sales, right? Like, you know, if you're doing a property management lead source, um, you could set up a CRM, you know, as your designated broker, um, set it up that way. And, you know, you just have to work it like you would any other lead. And it's, you know, sometimes you're going to find leads that are great. And other times you're like, okay, I've met you and you're not a great fit. But I think also identifying who you want to join your team. So for my team, I don't, I don't need to be that designated broker that says, oh, I have a hundred agents. Well, we all know that out of a hundred agents, you might have like five that are producing. I want a very specific agent. I'm looking for, you know, entrepreneurial, um, you know, people who are tech savvy or not afraid to learn being, you know, tech savvy, customer service orientated, um, very driven and, you know, kind of creating that avatar, if you will. Um, you know, I've even gone so far as back in the day when I was trying to recruit was like, do a cutout in your office of like a person and put all the attributes of that particular agent that you would want kind of creating your perfect avatar and go after that particular person. So I think it's just kind of dialing it down like you would, you know, if you're going after a property management lead or you're going after a listing or anything like that um, and finding the right people for your team, you know, people that, you know, will work really well with your team and, um, you know, are a good fit. Not, not everybody's a good fit. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a win and a loss sometimes because you can win when they get that big, you know, five figure commission, uh, it's a loss when they call you on a Sunday night at 7 PM and they can't figure out how to turn on their computer. Right. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, you definitely have to have a good process and know that, you know, I mean, for me, I have very specific, I have like a 10 year plan. Um, so yes, will I be supervising brokers and am I taking calls or text messages on the weekend? And am I asking, you know, answering questions about kind of weird situations? Yes, I am. And I'm happy to do that. You know, for me, I'm trying to differentiate myself in my market of really, you know, basically I'm happy to do business coaching and Weikert actually has a really cool business coaching program for all of our sales brokers. Um, so for those who do want to actually work and make money, um, you know, for, you know, come join my brokerage and I'm happy to actually help coach you on business and help make your business better. I want you to be better, you know, as a person and, you know, as a business person, you know, if you have, you know, again, I really work with my team of, Hey, come up with your goals. Like if you want to, you know, learn how to shoot a gun better, like write it down and I'll help you like, you know, make sure that you get to your gun class or whatever. I won't make them, you know, help them, but, um, you know, hold them accountable. And, um, you know, that's kind of what I'm focused on is, you know, am I a hundred percent brokerage? No, am I, but I am a, uh, broker that's available and wants you to be successful in whatever you want to do. So. Yeah. The value add proposition there, I think is fantastic because that's, that's really the convincing factor of trying to bring in an agent to your brokerage. And I'll never forget a little side story, fun, fun fact here. This was in 2006. Uh, 
uh, correction, 2009. I was, I was with Keller Williams from 2006 to 2009. You know, one year I sold 50 homes, had a great year. And then 2009 was starting to kind of a slowdown. And I just wanted to figure out kind of where to go, what direction I needed to go, kind of get better at doing sales. I hadn't got into property management yet at that point and uh, went to the team leader with Keller Williams and sat down with that person. And, uh, you know, that person was text messaging the entire time during a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Oh. And I said, what can I do to get better? What do, do I need to, you know, do something, do this, do that, and the other? Without a beat, they stopped text messaging, messaging. That team leader person looked up to me and said, hire an assistant. And went back to messaging. I'm like, are you effing kidding me? That, that's your secret to success is I need to go out and spend 30 grand, 40 grand a year to hire an assistant. Next week I left and started my own brokerage and never looked back. Now Keller Williams is great. I'm not dogging them, but uh, that person that they had in that role was not doing what Stacy is offering. Stacy, you're offering to sit down with somebody and say, okay, let's plan out your goals yeah. and get you where you want to be as a realtor, as a, as a licensed realtor salesperson and selling homes, working with buyers to buy homes, let's get you where you need to be. And that's a value add mm -hmm. from your perspective. And that's how recruiting works. You have to show those agents, they're real people, you know, you have right. to show them, Hey, we, this is how we're going to offer you significant value at coming to our brokerage. Now, some out there listening to me, uh, you know, we, we, it's baffling. Stacey, you've seen this before. Uh, you see the property management companies that don't do sales. Right. And, and it's just like, I don't understand why. And actually there are some that that's their tagline. Oh, we don't do sales. We only focus on property management. I'm like, why? I think they're, miss I think they're missing out. I think they're missing so much. Uh, it's, it's kind of baffling and almost comical, but you know, if that's a differentiator in the market and they're happy to do that, you know, yep. good for it. But uh, it's not something that you and I think is appropriate because we want to control the process and we yep. want to generate that revenue from commissions and also be able to assist our buyers, tenants, owners, yep sellers, all of that. We, yep. we want that all in-house. So to close this out real quick, I want to thank you for coming on the episode. I think this has been a really, really neat discussion on goal setting for 2021. And, you know, 2020 as the dumpster fire goes out the door uh, with the COVID and all the craziness with the, the business and the moratoriums. And, yep. you know, yep. we hope to all put this behind us. Uh, we're busy planning out the property management mastermind conference for 2021. Uh, Details of that to be announced here early in January. Awesome. And we're going to do an in-person conference somewhere. Uh, it's do or, you know, it, it's going to be all or nothing, let's say, at that conference. Uh, no virtual stuff. We're going to do it in person or nothing. And so awesome. uh, look forward for some details to that. Look forward to seeing you there at that conference. Uh, again, Stacey, thanks for checking in with me and talking yeah. about the goals. And we'll be in touch. All right. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. Right. Take care.